it's Kayla King and welcome back to my channel, or if you're new, welcome. Before we jump into part two of the Editor Diaries, I just wanted to say how excited I am to announce that this weekend, Saturday, October 2nd, I'm going to be taking part in the local Women's March. Now this is going to be happening across the nation, but I'm personally going to be attending in Buffalo, New York. I'm also going to be speaking at this event, and I couldn't be more grateful to the fact that women are willing to speak up against what is happening in our nation. I will be wearing this new t-shirt, which features a quote by the incomparable Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And on the back, I have included the slogan, bands off our bodies, as well as we support women, because we do. I'm looking forward to being able to talk about the Elpis pages, about women's rights, and the stories we tell about women. Getting back on track, today we continue with the Editor Diaries. If you are new here, we're currently working through a multi-series process of what it's like to be an editor of an online or in-print literary magazine or journal. In the last video, we tackled the step-by-step -step process for those beginning stages, and I'll have that first video linked in the description below. For part two, we are moving into the submission process. While there may be many other steps and decisions along the way, no part of this is as important as the submission process. This is where you will find work to publish. There will be much reading and tough decisions along the way, but there is no greater honor as an editor than to champion another author's work. And throughout this publishing process, there is the reminder that we as humans must tell stories to stay connected. While thinking about how you will receive and organize submissions may seem daunting, I find the best place to start is to look back on your own submission process. Were there any submission experiences that frustrated you? Was there an exceptional editor who offered personalized feedback during a rejection? As we walk through each step, it might be helpful for you to note those successes and near misses that you've experienced in your own journey. In my time submitting, I've come across a multitude of ways to submit work, though the top three are email, submittable, and online form. When you're just getting started, email may seem like the easiest choice for you. This puts most of the work on the author. They are gonna be the ones that are putting in the correct subject line, your correct email, and ensuring that they attach or paste in their submitted work. Now, this is all gonna depend on your submission guidelines. The one thing I do find with email, however, is because most of it is on the author, there's always room for human error. And the more items you require in that email, the greater the chance is that those items could be left out or ignored altogether. For myself, I'm incredibly thorough when I submit work. I actually keep a spreadsheet that tracks my research of magazines, including their name, if they publish online or in print, if they have specific deadlines, themes, and their route for submission. And I make sure that every single one of these pieces is followed when I'm submitting. I would hate to forget something and automatically be rejected from that slush pile. And while this may seem harsh for editors, there are certain things we need when looking at submissions, and if those are forgotten, it hinders our ability to fully review the submission and make sure that we can do our job as editors. And while you can and should add a note in your submission guidelines that explains what happens if authors do not follow your guidelines? It is important to note that sometimes these items are mistakenly forgotten. Again, human error. While submittable might be familiar to many authors, I do find that those just getting started into the submitting process might not know everything that submittable is capable of doing. For myself, on the author end, I know that I am able to track my submissions and to research and discover new places to submit my work. Now, what does this mean for you as an editor and for your online or in-print literary magazine or journal? This means that you're able to collect all submissions in one place. You're also able to market yourself on the submittable site so that other writers who might be seeking specific themes or genres that you represent can find you. Now, I do think that this is a great resource to use, especially if you have many people on your editorial team. You're able to assign out specific genres and review specific requests, and you can also deliberate right within Submittable, sending out responses in a batch or personalizing for those acceptances. Sounds great, right? Why wouldn't we want to make the submission process as easy as possible for our writers? For many editors and creatives, it is important to note the financial resources you'll be able to input into this project, or any project for that matter. 
While I loved Submittable and the way it allows for collaboration between different team members, I knew there wasn't wiggle room in my own budget to financially support using Submittable. For a basic plan, it is $99 a month or $999 when billed annually. This gives you three team seats, one project, 300 submissions per year, auto labels, payment processing, yes, no voting, team assignment, batch email and templates, in-app messaging, as well as dashboard data and exporting. These resources are immense, but making sure you can financially support utilizing this platform is gonna be key to the success of your overall creative endeavor. If you have a team of editors splitting this cost, it may be less of a restriction for you. While I've encountered a myriad of online forms, I must say my favorite to use is Google Forms. And this is what I chose to use for pages penned in pandemic, as those submissions also included interview questions for the featured series that I was running over on the blog. There were so many questions and almost too many for authors to be able to answer in an email submission. What I continue to love about this platform during this recent submission process is that it guides writers to all of the answers they need to input into the form, but it also helps me to know the consistent places where I can find information such as author name, email, title, word count, genre, and of course, the attached work. Once you know how you want to receive submissions, the next step is going to be discovering how you want to organize those submissions. Much of this process will be informed by whether or not you are using email, submittable, or online forms. For email, you may want to have separate folders in your inbox to easily organize between poetry submissions, fiction, nonfiction, essays, or whatever it is you decide to accept for your magazine. For Submittable, the system will organize your submissions, but you will also be able to assign to different team members as well. In both instances, you may want to use a spreadsheet to track your submissions, as this gives you a bird's eye view of everything you have received so far. While I use Google Forms to collect my data, I do not use this for tracking purposes. Instead, I use a combination of Trello and Google Sheets. I find great value in having an overview of all of my submissions in one place. And this is why I use a spreadsheet in addition to Trello. If you would be interested in seeing my process for using Trello in my daily writing life, let me know in the comments below. For submissions, I use Trello to organize from the initial read through to my publication schedule, all the way up to putting that final copy of the book out into the world. After you've decided how you're going to organize submissions, it will be helpful to know how you're going to review your submissions. Depending on whether or not you are working solo or with a team will greatly impact this process. For pages penned in pandemic, I worked with my best friend, Justin Mayer, as a fellow editor, and we used Trello as a form of organization and communication on days when we couldn't always be on the phone together. However, we did have editorial calls where we would work through decisions, often reading pieces out loud and talking about what we loved or what we wished for in a piece as well as assigning emails to ensure we could send out personalized responses to every author who submitted to us. Though this time I am working solo, I am following the same steps for reviewing my submissions. Now, when I'm working on a submission, the first thing I do is go to my Gmail account to see that a new Google form has been submitted. From there, I click the response, which is gonna take me into the Google form. And then I go to the individual and start scrolling to grab their preferred name. I have that copied. I'm gonna go into Trello and set up a new card from my template. And I'm going to add the author's name to the card and inside the submission info, as well as to a new line on my submission spreadsheet. From there, I'm gonna grab their email and go back to my Trello card and add it under the submission info tab. Next, I'm gonna grab the title or titles and add it under the to be reviewed section. I'm also gonna add it onto my spreadsheet as well as updating the submission type as well as the date received. And then I leave the status as to be read until I'm able to go in and review the overall submission. Next, I'm opening up the file that the author has attached and I pull that open in Google Docs, go to make a copy, and I add it to a separate folder called Incoming Submissions. 
Doing this removes the author from the work and allows me to make any in-text comments, like any edits that I might need. And then I pull the share link and add it under the submission section in my Trello card. Next, I'm gonna add a label that has to do with the genre. And that is how I add a new submission. Most often, I do not review the submission at the time it's added, which is why it's helpful to have the link to the document. When I review, I do an initial read through. Sometimes I will know instantly if I am going to accept a submission. Other times I might go back and make comments or edits. There are times when I feel a piece needs to be placed on the fence, allowing me extra time to go back and review. Once you know which pieces you will accept and which ones you won't, it's time to start sending your decisions to writers. While there are many ways to do this, especially if you are using Submittable and their batch options, I do find that my preferred way of sending out decisions is the kindest for writers. In creating my own decision-making process for both my collectives, I looked at experiences where I felt celebrated and supported in rejections. Now with my project, I always send personalized rejections and acceptances for that matter. I love to call attention to lines that I loved, themes that I've been able to pick out, and anything specific that really set my heart aflutter while I was reading. Now this may not be feasible for your project, but I knew for myself that this is something that I wanted to hold in the highest regard when it came time to sending my decisions. And while I have heard of instances where contributors are announced on social media or where rejections are sent all in one email with everybody CC'd, I would not recommend this. It doesn't recognize the courage or hard work of every submitting author. And without those submissions and brave souls, you wouldn't have work to publish in the first place. You wouldn't have people to support your new and beautiful creative endeavor. Long story short, don't be a jerk, even if the piece is not right for your project. However, if work violates your submission guidelines, if it includes violent or inappropriate content, I would suggest not responding. Unfortunately, we did have a few examples of this with pages penned in pandemic. And for my own safety, the safety of Justin and our fellow writers in the collective, I knew the best practice was simply not to respond. I will say I have gotten incredibly lucky with the Elpis pages. Every single self-identifying woman who has submitted to us so far has been gracious and kind and provided the most beautiful work. For this part of the process, it is also helpful to note whether or not you will be receiving simultaneous submissions. If writers are submitting to other places, there's always the chance that you might receive an email saying an author must withdraw their work. For myself, I knew this was okay. I love the opportunity to submit to 10, 15, 20 magazines if I feel a poem so deserves those places. And in doing so, we open ourselves up to the opportunity of future publications. And because I'm a writer first and foremost, I didn't find it fair to say that writers could only submit to me. It's also important to note whether you will be charging for submissions. For myself, we do not charge for submissions, neither for pages penned in pandemic or the Elpis pages. And this is first and foremost because we are not paying our authors. All proceeds are being donated to reputable organizations. However, if you are looking for a way to further support your magazine or journal, a great option I have found is charging a small fee for expedited submissions or receiving feedback. Also, the fee for a faster turnaround time or for feedback really cuts to the heart of what writers want most. We don't want to wait to hear back about submissions. We want to make sure that we're putting the best work possible out into the world. Perhapend Mag does this extremely well. Please check them out if you haven't already. I'll leave a link in the description below. Here is where I note that many, if not most editors, do this for free with only the love of literature as a reward for the time, willingness, and dedication they have to giving authors a platform for their writing. If there's anything else you would like to know about the submission process, let me know in the comments below. That's all for part two of the Editor Diaries. I hope you'll join me next time as we dive into branding and social media. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and remember, no matter where the day takes you, dream big.